Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Flesch, and I am the director of the Mining and Rollo Jamison Museums, and welcome to this fifth of seven presentations as part of the 2022 Winter Lyceum titled 13,000 Years of Driftless Ingenuity. Today is the 20th day of March 2022, and I'm broadcasting from Platteville, Wisconsin, home of the world's largest letter M on beautiful Platte Mound in the heart of the upper Mississippi Valley lead and zinc mining region where the Badger State was born. Reflecting on a wonderful year behind us, the museum campus celebrated three milestone anniversaries last year. Founded in 1965 by the city of Platteville, 2021 marked the 50th anniversary of the opening of the Mining Museum, the 45th anniversary of the opening of the Bevins Mine in the museum's backyard, and the 40th anniversary of the opening of the Rollo Jamison Museum. We have many programs and initiatives in store for this special new year that celebrate human ingenuity, inquiry, enterprise, and development, what might be called the pioneering spirit, in the context of our unique driftless area landscape over a long timeline. I invite you to stay up to date on these programs as well as to make your reservations and to support current initiatives online at www.mining.jameson.museum. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to enjoy a discussion titled 13,000 Years of Driftless Ingenuity, presented by a distinguished panel of archaeologists and the Historic Preservation Officer of the Ho-Chunk Nation. I look forward to introducing those speakers shortly. As you may know, uh, the campus of the Mining and Rollo Jamison Museums is a place of lifelong learning for our region, whose narratives recognize the historical and contemporary importance of Native American tribes within the upper Mississippi Valley Mining District, and of course, the greater Driftless area. It's also in close proximity to Native American communities on both sides of the Mississippi River. The museum campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Ho Chunk Nation, as well as the Potawatomi, the Sac, and Fox tribe of the Mississippi, known as the Meskwaki Nation. The area was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for Native tribes. Wisconsin is still home to 11 federally recognized tribal nations. Because we're all present to hear the views and opinions of today's panelists, the Mining and Rollo Jamison Museums are not only a place where history is preserved, but also a place where the sense of place of our driftless region and the pioneering spirit of its peoples over a long timeline are shared with the next generation. Consistent with the city of Platteville's commitment to inclusivity, equity, and diversity, and thanks to grant support from Wisconsin Humanities, the museum has begun working towards building relationships with Native American communities through a fresh identification and analysis of museum special collections and a reinterpretation of individual artifacts, past museum exhibits, and educational program content. So I'd like to thank all of you who have registered to participate live today, as well as those who may be watching a recording of this event from our library of virtual programs. I extend a warm welcome to current friends of the Mining and Rollo Jamison Museum members and donors, and I'd like to thank the sponsors whose financial support has made this program possible. A&W Restaurant of Platteville, Claire Bank, Edward Jones Financial Advisor, Bob Hundhausen, FEH Design, H&R Block, Inspiring Community, State Farm Agent Jordan Holthouse, and our media sponsor, Voice of the River Valley Magazine. And now, before we begin our program, I'd like to invite you to participate in a question and answer session at the end of this evening's presentation. Because we're a big group of more than 150, we're doing this via Zoom. In the interest of time, I'd like to invite you to type out your questions as they come to mind and to submit them via the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen during the talk. So if you want to take a quick moment, look for the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. At the end, the speakers will answer as many of the questions as they're able in the order in which they are received. And I'm now pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, William Quackenbush is a tribal member of the Ho-Chunk Nation of Wisconsin and also works for the Ho-Chunk Nation as a Tribal Historic Preservation Officer and Cultural Resources Division Manager. Welcome, Mr. Quackenbush. 
Robert Ernie Bozhart is an archaeologist with more than 40 years of experience with the Driftless area, Wisconsin and Midwest. He's co-owner of Driftless Pathways, LLC, together with his wife, a museum scientist and archaeologist, Danielle Benden. Uh, Ms. Benden and Mr. Bozhart assembled tonight's panel and spent the last year assisting the museum with analyzing the more than 1,100 stone tools in the museum collection and developing a new exhibit that we'll learn a little bit more about this evening. Uh, Dr. James Thieler, also joining us as an archaeologist with more than 50 years experience in the field, laboratory and classroom. He is a professor emeritus of archaeology at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse and senior research associate for the Mississippi Valley Archaeology Center at the UW La Crosse. He specialized in the identification and interpretation of pre-Columbian human subsistence systems and will provide insight on the use of animal resources by Native Americans in the Driftless area of Western Wisconsin during pre-Columbian times. Dr. Catherine Egan Bruhi, also joining us, is the Emeritus Regional Vice President for Commonwealth Heritage Group, a full service heritage management and consulting firm. Her analytical expertise is in paleoethnobotany, the study of human exploitation of plant resources and the origins of agriculture. She's got experience working with sites from throughout the Midwest and upper Great Lakes and will provide her insight on what people grew and harvested so we can better understand what plant resources would have been part of the Driftless area landscape and how that would have shaped human life here. Also joining us is Dr. Philip Milhouse of the Midwest. He's the Midwest Regional Director for the Archaeological Conservancy and Principal Investigator at Red Gates Archaeology. Many of you may remember Dr. Milhouse from his Lyceum presentation back in 2019 titled uh, Native American Mining in the Upper Mississippi Valley industrial production, conflict, and dispossession across the lead mining frontier. Uh, as a native of the Galena area with a lot of years of experience as an archaeologist with the Illinois State Archaeological Survey, Dr. Milhouse will be sharing insight on the critical role of Native American lead mining in the upper Mississippi Valley mining district. So please join me in welcoming this distinguished panel. Our first presenter will be William Quackenbush. Well, good afternoon, slash evening, correct? Thank you, first of all, uh, for inviting me to um, be part of this discussion. It was, <clears throat> I felt quite fitting, you know, talking about the extensive history of the Driftless area, <clears throat> that um, uh, it was nice that the whole chunk was included in that process. That said, um, along with me talking, I am going to also be, um, use a PowerPoint presentation uh, with a few slides on here. <clears throat> and so um, uh, when I was first asked to uh, present here um, and they mentioned the ability to talk about, you know, an extensive history uh, uh, through time for the Ho-Chunk uh, indigenous to this area here, um, I began to realize that it was going to be a very difficult task to uh, place within, you know, 10 minutes, you know, the ability to talk about our history uh, within the Driftless area. So that said, uh, first of all, thank you. And what I will do now, though, is uh, talk a little bit about uh, the Ho-Chunk and our ancestral footprint. Uh, we talk about a place called Mogashuch, which you'll see on this map. Uh, maybe you can see my mouse over here moving. Uh, in, 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 in English, it's um, Red Banks right over there, uh, modern day Green Bay. You know, I say that's where God's country is, is in this area right here. Uh, because it's such a beautiful place. You always hear people often referring to uh, this area here as something, you know, somewhat of a paradise, especially within our tradition and, and culture and heritage, the whole chunk talk about this area. I uh, mean, you know, a place that we've always preferred to live. And Mogasuch is our, our place of origin that we have, that we hold in our, in our oral history and our stories. And it is a place that we look upon as um, a place where our first fires were lit. And so between Mogashuch, you know, St. Paul area, down Ixate, the big Mississippi River, all the way back up to Illinois to Goose Gate, Chinook over here, um, this whole area ancestry is what we prefer to call home. Uh, this is where, you know, they state that this is where we have always been and we uh, are here presently, and this is where we hope we'll be in the future. Uh, and you'll hear through time and history, time and time again, uh, different groups coming and going and uh, talking, you know, about the extensive ability for the Ho-Chunk to you know, state that this is where we have always been. There's no other people on this earth that can uh, lay claim to this area, really. Folks have come and gone uh, during the historic period. For example, you'll hear a lot about how 
you know, the different tribes that came here and saw refuge in this area, for example, or asked for passage to this area, or elected to stay here for a brief period of time due to different things, you know, such as conflicts to the east, you know, taking place. And so the Sac and Fox and the Kickapoo in Miami, and a few of the tribes that trickled into this area even during those periods of time, even before the French and the British and the early Americans arrived here. Uh, so, and then you'll see that, of course, through the treaty processes, you know, Sounds as if that you folks had heard some uh, extensive information about the treaties in the past, and that how treaties were created between you know different governments to assure uh, that the certain footprints, obviously, in, in in this region were recognized for certain groups of people. Um, again, a whole chunk of always called this place our home, and even through the historic periods, obviously, you know, you'll hear a lot about uh, well, well, you know, they signed a treaty that stated they'd stay within these boundaries and all these other tribes and theirs. And those soon were dashed upon the rocks, obviously. And and after the treaties were done, the removals began. You know, so anyway, so but with carrying on, um, there's obviously different ways of looking at history. Um, our oral traditional ways of life, you know, when we talk about our history, um, oftentimes you'll hear people, you know, referring to our history as, you know, it's, you know, legends or folklore. And uh, when we talk about our history to our children and, you know, and our groups over there, um, it's all done orally. We don't rely on the written language, you know, uh, for passing down our accurate history. We don't rely on, you know, the likes of electronic processes there to uh, place our history down into this. We try to, you know, pass our oral history on accurately from generation to generation. Um, and and you'll, what you'll see in the background in this PDF, for example, uh, this, uh, this slide here is um, recently the uh, federal agency contacted us and you know, they asked, you know, you say you've been here forever, you know, this area here. And they have a question about the soil series down there by Richland Center you know, along the Wisconsin River. <clears throat> and long story short, they documented that soil series on here and they tied it to a story that one of our tribal elders of old, Jim Funmaker, uh, related to them. It was called Ruchma Ruha Ichide. Uh, and what that word basically means, it's a, it's a time timeline. Uh, that's when the, the, you know, the ice and the earth formed a dam for a brief period of time along Ichide there, right? And it caused the water from the Mississippi to flow backwards. And it caused a small lake there to form for a short period of time until that dam broke away. And when it broke away, all that water it had retained uh, began to wash back out. <clears throat> and what it had left was this, you know, this soil that they now can go back and find that soil. And if they do analysis of that soil, you know, it shows that soil had is a mixture, a combination of the Minnesota, obviously, and the St. Croix and the whole well, Mississippi waters. And it came and hit that lake, set it in out. And there's that soil left there today as a, as a physical evidence of this lake being there. But you don't hear too much about that lake, you know, in, in, in uh, today's uh, science, you always hear about the glacier lake, you know, that uh, was dammed up by, you know, up there by Wisconsin Dells, which we have our own stories about that process too. Um, but long story short, Jim Fundmaker was fast to explain that our ancestors of old was sitting in what now is mean, known as the driftless area, right? Uh, but we didn't call it the driftless area. We always refer to this area that our ancestors, you know, lived during a period of time that glacier episodes were taken, you know, place here. We always referred to it as, you know, a place of refuge. This is, you know, where our people had to stay until the glacier receded and we followed it back to our ancestral homelands. <clears throat> but that said, you know, when they talked about the soil series and they decided to go ahead and name it after this, you know, as you know, assurance that, you know, that this is how that soil had been created here during that period of time. Um, Jim Ratke, who was a tribal liaison for the NRCS there, he stated, matter of fact, like, see, and now our, our, you know, our, your whole chunk history, your oral history is beginning to back up our science. And Jim Funmaker mentioned to him or to the group that he, our, our whole chunk history has been here much longer than science and that your science is all beginning to back up our oral history. So whether that is the case or not, um, that discussion took place and I always made note of that in my mind, you know, that how we have the ability for science, you know, right, and, and Ho-Chunk oral history uh, to work together. 
to better inform, you know, not only our present generation, but also those in the future. So that area that we were talking about, obviously, and uh, was this region right on here. And one of, one of the <clears throat> stories we talk about is a place where we used to reside, where there was this ice that had formed around us on three different sides. And uh, we wouldn't see, you know, the likes of the sun until midday. And oftentimes you'll hear about, you know, the geologists and such, they talk about how this ice formed, this ice pack was, you know, as thick as, you know, a mile in some areas. And so those stories that we talk about kind of relays down into some of this study that you can uh, hear taking place in this region. <clears throat> and to think about living in an area that, you know, the ice formed all the way around you, life obviously was different. And so you talk about what we teach our children today, right? You know, um, this is, you know, obviously, you know, an artist's rendition of how they view, you know, you know, and this is what I teach her through third graders, right? You know, that, you know, you had a whole bunch of these same looking individuals throwing, you know, spears and arrows into these mastodons and, you know, cooking them over the fire and, and they were living on the ice. And, and that just isn't the case. You know, I mean, when the glacier recedes, there's nothing left. It's barren for the most part for quite a few years. And you don't live alongside it. If you live, you live, you know, in an area that's conducive for life for a while until our grandmother, the earth, uh, comes back once again and gives you something that's a little more readily. And <clears throat> so we talk about, you know, life of old, you know, in our stories, you know, and how life has always been good. We've never been ones to suffer, you know, through life, you know, that we've always enjoyed uh, the better things that life has to give us. And and no different than today, we enjoy you know, uh, socializing, you know, we enjoy you know, having food and drink uh, to give to other people when they come to our, to our villages and our homes. And so, you know, whatever happens today, you know, happened in the past and vice versa. Uh, we've never been one to have to worry about living well within our ancestral footprint. <clears throat> and uh, this this rope, these students that are holding this uh, out of this group out of Rooka, um, this is the one way that we had figured a way of telling uh, time. Uh, this rope is obviously it's going to be around the corner of the structure and uh, in this room out of here, and it's 50 foot long. And there's every inch on that rope is 20 years. And so this individual holding the end of this rope right here, uh, he's 2019. This is the last time I was able to speak to students in public. Uh, but he's holding that rope and uh, she's holding the rope pretty much close to where Jim Nicolay first stepped ashore in Green Bay, right? 1634, uh, 1492, they said Chris, Christopher Columbus failed the rule. Well, after that historic period is where the Americas basically were discovered, um, continues this rope all the way back to the last leaf period of 16, 12,000 years ago. And we have stories that you can tie along this rope of the history that we talk about the, the transformation and adaptation not only the environment around us, but our, of our culture and our ways of life, they call it our practices, how we had to adapt to through these periods of time here, or we would have ceased to exist just alongside those mastodons and short-faced bears and so on and so forth. And so, you know, and initially when we, we, were, we were tasked out to talk a little bit, 10 minutes, obviously, you know, about, you know, our portion of how our, our, we present tonight, it was going to be very difficult for me to talk about the extensive history in detail. So I, I tend to touch upon the tips of those icebergs is what I try to do. And this rope is no different than that. They'll have these tips of the icebergs. And she's holding 1 AD. And so three, you know, 300 BCE to about 1300 AD is right between this here. That extensive period of time, obviously, is when the effigy mounds, you know, and the little conicals and linears and effigy mounds are being placed on this very earth around us. A lot of it in that driftless area, right? And that period of time there obviously is much more longer than the historic periods in here. And yet this is what 99% of our students learn today about the history and culture in this region right here. So, so we have a lot to work to do together. And to keep it short, because you're gonna see a lot of arrowheads tonight, a lot of, a lot of spear points, a lot of, a lot of tool, stone tools out there and not only stone tools, other items, even though if they're associated in that same big basket of tools. <clears throat> and this Hicks and Core site has a very extensive history of the Ho-Chunk people. Uh, the site where this is mined from or taken from 
holds a very significant and important role in our history. That's one of our most ancient sites that we talk about still today. <clears throat> and the fellow people that are speaking tonight are well and very knowledgeable of the use of Hickson Port site as a very beautiful tool, very highly traded around the watershed of the Mississippi and all the, all the rivers that went into it. So you can always tell the footprint of how far the Ho-Chunk would travel and other people would travel when they come to gather this material and take it back with them or us taking it with us for trade and bring stuff back into our area. Trade has always been something and the, the ability to travel as humans has always been something that we've always enjoyed doing. Our young men would go and they come back with many stories of all the different peoples that we would run into throughout this, you know, river share, watershed area of the Mississippi. And those stories that we still have stories about all these individuals. We purchased a property not so long ago here that has a form of Pritchoglyph on it. And on there it talks about this journey that one of our groups of people went on. They come back and they had saw, you know, different animals and these different people and they're all just carved out on this rock. And so we purchased that property and hang on, hung on to it there is because we for fear that this was going to go the other way and be destroyed. But that said, the stone in itself, we could talk for days on the significance of what it represents to us. <clears throat> of course, during the historic periods, we talk about the value of trade and the first French that come here, and obviously the British and the early Americans that took place from the 1600s and 1700s and the early 1800s on. How we fast, you know, uh, ridded ourselves of these other tools, those stone tools and those pot, that pottery and so on and so forth uh, for trade for stuff that was much more durable. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, what we also ran into during those historic periods was the, uh, the land sessions, right? The treaties, uh, the loss of the acreage here and the eventual removals for the whole chunk, for example. Uh, they moved us to no different, no less than five different reservations, you know, west of the Mississippi. And what went along with those removals, obviously, was a lot of, um, uh, you know, boarding schools that took place. Uh, this assimilation process, this manifest destiny of uh, wanting to uh, turn us into, you know, Americans or we would have ceased to exist. That was really taking place. And if it hadn't been for the tenacity of my ancestors of retaining their oral history, and, and the ability to practice some of the things that have held us through thick and thin through the years, you know, the ability to build dugout canoes, you know, the, the process of, you know, those simple things of uh, keeping us together socially, um, we would have ceased to exist. And the oral history we still retain, you know, is, is scattered at best, you know, but each clan has a respective roles in telling their sides of the story on here. Uh, so through that combination of process down there, we still have the ability to talk matter of factly about our steep history and our ancestral footprint. Um, you can't imagine the derision our tribe went through and the thousands of the people that died in our trail of tears from this removal process, only for half of ours to come back here. Otherwise, I wouldn't be telling the story with you folks today. I'd be hopefully living in Nebraska or, or whatever. You know? so, but anyway. One of the things you have to remember though, is that when you talk about trying to talk about the history of another people uh, by studying the few you know, tools that you, you can uh, bring from the ground now and, and some of the, uh, the soil disturbance that took place in our villages and our fasting sites and our places of you know, gatherings, um, is that it just tells you just the tip of that iceberg of the story. There's nothing on here save maybe these shells, for example, that stand at the time that it was buried. And yet there's so much history right here, those foods, you know, and the, the, the use of the materials that our grandmother earth reclaims back. And there's no story with that unless you ask the very people uh, that utilize that stuff. And, and we talk about, you know, these stone tools and yet the use of them and how we've had to adapt to them, you know, right from the clothes, points of spears and the laos and the bows. And today we use the rifle like everyone else. And perhaps, right, our children in the future will be using these lightsabers, right? And that's just the way history passes on. And so these timelines that we talk about, you know, they're a living thing. We try to learn from our past so that, you know, we, we don't have struggles to this day and then we can pass it on you know, better to our children in the future. Um, so, and I'll leave it at that. Um, if there'll be some questions and answers on the far end, um, I wanted to uh, in some way express, you know, to the, you know, listening ear this evening that 
uh, what we're talking about is uh, someone's lifestyles, their ways of life, and that it is isn't stagnant and locked in time. Well, those effigy mounds, even though they were placed there 2,000 years ago, these tools that were used back then, they still have a life to them, that they have the ability to tell these stories. And that's how they come alive. It's through you and I and through whoever we spread this knowledge with out there. This is where everything still continues you know, to have this living process involved. So, other than that, I hope that I spoke loud enough. I know this microphone isn't the best. And I apologize if I didn't. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to Eric. That's wonderful, Mr. Quackenbush. Thank you so much. And now we'll hear from uh, from Ernie Robert uh, Bozhart. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Bill. That was great. Um, and uh, and happy spring, everybody. Um, I my segment is to review the process that, that we did, uh, Danielle and I, at the uh, at the museum where we reinventoried or rehoused the uh, their their artifact collection. And so I'm going to talk mostly about that. Um, and most of the artifacts, as as Bill mentioned a lot of the material culture, a lot of the material things that people use in the past don't preserve. So uh, what it does preserve is stone. So the vast majority of the artifacts in the museum are stone artifacts. And so my focus is, of my segment is gonna be on, on, on stone tools and things. Uh, Jim and Katie are gonna be talking about bone and plant remains. Uh, uh, so before I get into the, the museum collections, this slide is just to sort of an archeological rendition of the rope that Bill just showed you. Um, this is a timeline. Um, that starts at the left side on the top bar 13,000 years ago, and it goes over on the right side to uh, the time of European contact. Um, and archaeologists uh, define these traditions that you'll hear uh, throughout some of the talks tonight, Paleo-Indian and Archaic and Woodland. Um, and these represent uh, periods of times where people lived certain life ways that they that changed with changing of the climate. So from the end of the Ice Age to a long drought during the Archaic and into the climate that's more like today during, during the woodland tradition. And through those changes in the environment and the changing in the plant and animal life, um, people changed their, their stone tools. So they went from Clovis spear points that Bill represented on the left um, to the bow and arrow about 1300 years ago on the right. And, and all through time changes in the styles of the projectile points, uh, the spear points and the arrowheads through time. Um, and other changes uh, uh, for, you know, the, build, the building of the mounds and the, and the starting of of gardening uh, that Katie will talk about and things like that. So this is just a framework to give you an idea of that, that things change through time. Um, and as archaeologists, we try to reconstruct that past as best we can through material culture and, and the settlement patterns and such. Um, but this, the, the people we're talking about when we're talking about archaic and paleo Indians, those are the ancestors of the Ho-Chunk people and the other tribes in this region. So it's, it's you know, these are, these are their ancestors that we're talking about. All right, so the project, uh, it started off with, uh, there are about 1,100 artifacts in the collection. Um, they, they, uh, they, they didn't know, there's no provenience associated with, with almost all of the objects. They didn't really know where they came from. Uh, so one of the first questions is, are they even from Grant County? They just have these art, these objects and such. So um, we, we began to sort them. Uh, it, they, were in, they were in groups, uh, these bags that we pour out and in the bag, so we're like biface preforms, which if you stand for the flint napping session at the end, you'll learn more about what those are, but they're unfinished tools essentially. And then, you know, there, there were projectile points that we could sort through time uh, by shape um, and, uh, and hide scrapers and stone knives and things like that. So we grouped the things um, and then we would read information over to Rachel uh, Vang on the left, the museum employee who uh, would type uh, the data into a database. Um, and, uh, and then we would, uh, they printed off tags and they labeled everything. Um, and, um, and, and so then we uh, came back and, and we were able to take all of the projectile points and, and sort of sort them by time and organize them by groups. So you put the Paleo Union points in, in one tray and the archaic points in another and the woodland points in another. So the slide on the right, those are woodland projective points uh, through time. Um, and so, so that set up the, uh, the rehousing of it and cutting out individual slots for each point to, to take care of them. 
Um, and, uh, and so that was a lot of the project and it took a long time. And, and when it was done, Julian was really happy. This is their son, Julian, who helped us. We were homeschooling him through the COVID. Everybody was masked up through this process. So it's nice not to be there anymore. So, um, but that was the basic process. Um, these are just some examples of some of the drawers when we're done. And on the left, uh, again, we, 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 I did, we sort, we sorted the projectile points, the spear points and the arrowheads by shape and that equals time. So um, you do the Paleo Indians all the way through up to the woodland tradition and up to just, just before contact. And basically all of the cultural traditions are represented in the collection. So they've got 12,500 years of, of pre-contact era represented by the projective points. And those of course represent different hunting styles that Jim will talk more about uh, in his section. Um, the, the vast majority of the, of the artifacts were, were unfinished preforms, but the material that they were made from uh, is all local flint. It's Galena Chert. And that tells us that, that the collections that were there are coming from the Platteville area. These are coming from farms on the ridgetops where, where, where Native Americans would find Galena Chert and start working it into stone tools. And they didn't finish some of them. And, that, and that's what the farmers were picking up and bringing into the museum. Uh, along with the finished projective points. And on the right side, I'm sorry, then there's also height knives and scrapers too. And those represent different activities in terms of um, processing animals, uh, butchering and, and scraping the hides and butchering the meat. Um, and then on the right, there were a number of, of ground stone tools. These are basically axes. Um, and, uh, and those are for woodworking, making dugout canoes and, and cutting poles for lodges and, and splitting staves to make uh, bows and, and spear shafts and such. Um, but, the, but the stone these are made out of, these are almost all made out of basalt and that doesn't occur in the Driftless area. So those are all brought in from elsewhere. Those are imported uh, stones. Um, so in looking at all of the stone tool collection all for the artifacts, um, the vast majority are from the local area. So the collections are representing local sites from Grant County. There are some exotic materials that were brought in from far away. Uh, there are some Hickston silicified sandstone that Bill referenced up by Black River Falls from, from Silver Mound. Um, uh, there's probably 10 or 15 pieces of that. So that's coming from you know, over 100 miles away. Uh, Moline chirp from the, rock, the mouth of the Rock River. Burlington chirp from even further down in Illinois and down into Missouri. Um, and then all of the ground stone, those are, those are not from Grant County. So those, those exotic materials represent either trade systems or people traveling far distance those materials back to Grant County. So this is the last slide I'm gonna do. And I just wanna introduce the seasonal round. And, and what this is, is um, it's just to represent that Native Americans through time understood where resources were throughout the year. So, so resources aren't equal throughout the year. In the winter time, you can get certain foods that you, in the summertime, you get lots of foods that you can't get in the winter time, for example. So the seasonal round just, just represents spring on the left, like the season today, um, or I guess it's on the right, uh, lower right, but, uh, but fish are spawning and the, the turtles are getting ready to lay their eggs. And there's, there's just lots of the plants are starting to sprout. And in the summer, you, you, you plant your gardens, you can get the garden food, but there's also fish and things like that. And, and in the fall, uh, the nuts come on and it's, it's a season around. So Native Americans, you know, they, they, they recognize the seasons and they knew where resources were in the landscape. And on the outer, this outer size, outer ring of the, the, the season around here, uh, these are Ho-Chunk names uh, for the various moons, the lunar, the lunar cycle that they, they mark the year by. Um, but a season around is a very important concept for understanding how they've done the landscape. And Jim and Katie, well, I'm sure will reference this as well in their talks about the plant and animal remains. But the basic dichotomy throughout the pre-contact era for many thousands of years is that in the summertime, groups of people would come to the big rivers like the Mississippi and you could have villages because you can support a lot of food because there's lots of food at that time. You can support a lot of people, I'm sorry, because there's lots of food at that time. So they're growing their gardens, they're fishing and, and, and whatnot. Big villages in the summertime, building mounds, things like that. In the wintertime, when the river freezes over and there's not as much food, the, the family groups would, would disperse into the Driftless Bay Hills and live in rock shelters such as this. Um, the only other, this is the last thing I'm going to show you is that is that in terms of stone to get stone to make tools and clay to make pottery, which I didn't talk about, there's a little bit of pottery in the collection. 
infections. But, but to get those out of the ground, you can't do that in the winter when the ground's frozen. So those are warm season activities. And the whole chunk actually have a, a you know, if they, if they transition from spring to summer, the digging month. And that probably refers to gardening as much as anything. But that's also the beginning of the time when you could get stone tool out of the ground to replenish your tools, your stone tools, and to dig clay to make your pots. That's all I have. And I'm going to turn this over to Jim next. Well, thank you, Arnie. Uh, you gave my talk, so I appreciate it. And I'll be signing off now. No, uh, very excellent summary. And I appreciate your comments. Uh, our earliest evidence for needy folks in this region is at the end of the ice age, just the very terminus of the ice age, 13,000 plus years ago. Uh, and, and there was probably some, some emphasis on hunting big games such as mammoths and mastodons. Uh, this is the Boaz Mastodon found in Richland County or part of it. And one of these points, very specialized points, a fluted point uh, or so-called Clovis point was found in close proximity to the skeleton of this Boaz Mastodon. Uh, big game hunters, very sophisticated, uh, highly technical hunting technology and hunting tools. It's beautiful. These are real colors of Cochrane Flint from one site in the region. Um, and we don't have a lot of sites at this time. We think human population isn't, isn't uh, terribly high, uh, but people are certainly hunting and harvesting big game animals. Uh, we have a long period of time after uh, the Ice Age journey had it listed as the early archaic, late Paleo Indian, early archaic, that period from say 11,500 years ago to 6,000 or 7,000 years ago. We don't have a lot of information. People are on the landscape. They're not terribly abundant. They're thinly distributed. Uh, and they're probably hunting some bison, uh, bison occidentalis, a form or earlier form of, of American bison uh, have been found in the region. Uh, they're probably hunting already deer and elk in this area. And uh, it is, uh, in, in fact, not perfectly well known what they're doing, but they are harvesting the landscape. They probably have a, a perfect knowledge of the landscape, which is important. Starting about 6,000 years ago, we have great records of winter and summer sites. Uh, many of our winter sites, as Ernie indicated, are on rock shelter faces. This is a rock shelter in Grant County called Preston Rock Shelter. There were 16 feet of excavated materials below here that had Native American remains layered, stratified like peeling an onion, going back in time. The most common animal in this long sequence starting 6,000 years ago is our friend, the white-tailed deer. And white-tailed deer made up made up a, the, the, the majority of the, the diet. There's always an elk or two present, but there are many, many, many deer. And we can look at the deer and we can look at the dentition on, on deer. And these are broken jaw bones or mandibles, lower jaw bones of white-tailed deer. And the erupting teeth on here give us a sense of when these animals were harvested. And what we, our, our best knowledge today is folks are pulling back into what I would call the interior of the driftless area, the protected valleys. These would be extended family groups. So this might be two or three nuclear families or extended families, maybe 15 people, and they would occupy special places. If you have a south or southwest facing rock shelter, it holds the heat, protects you from the north winds. And folks are clearly harvesting deer at a certain time of the year. And that is again, the, the very end of summer, late fall, starting in September, we see big harvest of white-tailed deer. We also see white-tailed deer bones always broken, or even the toe bones are broken. And so it's pretty clear people are extracting the nutrient-rich bone marrow from these. They're probably drying meat, preparing hides, and, and uh, preparing for winter. Uh, harvests go through November and December, then they really fall off. Uh, these folks, these native peoples were just superior deer hunters. Uh, certainly they worked in groups, uh, probably all male groups in harvesting deer. I think they did most of their work by doing drives, which is an efficient way to harvest deer. Uh, it's like, a, it's like a, a ball team, a football team. 
So you know who's the best shot with a football? You know what Aaron Rodgers can do or Brett Favre can do? You got the guys who are the best shot, the coolest hands at Nick points. You have people that are drivers. Everybody participates. Everybody uh, participates in the harvest of the animals. Animals are brought back. Hides are used. And virtually, it's often said every part is used, virtually every part of these animals are used. And this was a process for a very long period of time. Inland winter, and as Ernie pointed out, you go, you work your way to the streams, especially the Wisconsin, Mississippi River in our area during the, during the warm season that you pull back, you know, the living's easy. Now would be about the time they would be looking at moving the rivers. And we find use of shellfish, freshwater mussel shells. This is a site in, uh, in Crawford County. You can see the layered or stratified shells here. Uh, native peoples are very efficient at harvesting fish. And fish are a tasty resource, as most of us know. I can never turn down a good fish dinner. Uh, all kinds of ways, including spearing at night, harvesting with nets, spawning fish. Uh, this are, the, here are a few, uh, here's a head of a 50 pound mud cat or flathead catfish. There's some other things in this feature in lacrosse. This is a bone in the back of the head. And this bone is from this fish here. And this is a 50 pound mud cat or flathead catfish. These are 30 pound, 25 pound catfish here. Those are much bigger fish. Just the head in this feature, 20% of the weight is in the head alone. Lots of excellent meat in that head for consumption. So these would be pulled apart, cooked, pulled apart and, and consumed. And if you come to the Mississippi River, you can still buy catfish cheap dinners if you like. Uh, Here's a part of a, a sturgeon head being excavated in La Crosse area. And here is a, here is a, a, a lake sturgeon. This was a lake sturgeon. This is a lake sturgeon. And certainly people are harvesting fish again during the, probably during spawning times, they take a few fish. The channel catfish could be taken by a, a system known as noodling, which they take them off of their, off of their spawning site. You can take a large catfish that way and have a, have a very tasty meal. Also, you can have nice large batches of small fish. Bullheads are excellent to eat. Uh, flathead catfish are excellent food. Here's a feature, you know, lots of fish bones we can see. And here's the same bone we looked at from the channel cat prior. Uh, all kinds of birds are taken, but in the summer they're taking uh, uh, Canada geese are commonly taken as well as their eggs. Uh, wood ducks, mallards are, are common. Common nesters are taken in some numbers. Other tasty treats we have include snapping turtles and uh, other kinds of turtles. Turtles and snapping turtles can be pretty easily taken about the first week in June. They come up to lay their eggs, can take a few of those. And, and they make a tasty meal. And we find certainly the burned shells of these commonly at many archeological sites. A warm season, uh, resources on the Mississippi River, on the interior, cool season resources. Uh, certainly people are using rock shelters, but they also use other kinds of lodges, particularly during the warm season. Uh, White-tailed deer, are, are very lightly used during the warm season. They do occur. And uh, we will see white-tailed deer, uh, uh, a primary resource. And when we get to effigy mound times, we see that uh, uh, white-tailed deer are taken in large numbers. And uh, this is a time when the bow and arrow is introduced. And it seems like human populations increase steadily and uh, white-tailed deer are harvested. And then suddenly about, uh, uh, a thousand years ago, we see the end of effigy mound culture. And during an effigy mound period, we had folks, I don't want to get into Katie's territory, but we certainly are, are involved in horticulture and gardening. And then around uh, 1050 or 1100, 
AD, we see people switch to corn agriculture. And this may be a result of some stress in the environment with the number of deer and the number of population, human populations increased. And uh, we, we see some shifts. <clears throat> These are agricultural fields, which uh, Katie may talk about, and the lacrosse area has been excavated. We get to this later part of the uh, of the, the pre-contact period. We see some native folks probably going to the far west and harvesting bison and bringing back certain bison products. So there, there's a long evolution of of subsistence, but these are folks who know their landscape perfectly, know how to exploit it, exploit it, and I think in a very reasonable way. For example, uh, you never see baby deer uh, on our archaeological sites or harvesting them at the proper time in the fall and winter, and during the spring and summer, they're, they're not harvesting these animals, and certainly not the young, the young of the year. So uh, very efficient native folks who knew their territory, operated these family groups. And uh, I, maybe I'll leave it there and let Katie take it from there. It's right, 10 minutes. Thanks, Jim. You set me up well, thank you. Um, I'm pleased to share my understanding of pre-contact pre plant-based subsistence with you. And I really wanna thank Eric for the invitation to join this distinguished group of presenters. I'm going to start with the Paleo Indian. If Eric can move me forward here to Paleo Indian. I'll just be one moment. How's that? It hasn't changed. Okay. So glad it's you and not me. And how's that? Nope. There you go. Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, great. Paleo Indian people occupied um, a late Pleistocene, early Holocene tundra environment. And as Jim was talking about, they were mobile hunter gatherers. They likely lived in small bands and moved seasonally following game resources. Um, as Jim said, the sites are often extremely ephemeral. Most are, are found in plowed environments and represented only by lithic scatters. Um, however, uh, interestingly, in 2019, a Paleo Indian site was found buried five feet below the surface um, in the Connecticut River Valley, not far from where I grew up. Um, and this site provides a rare glimpse at Paleo Indian plant subsistence um, exploitation. The site um, was quite large. It produced 15,000 artifacts and 27 features, including hars and refuse fits and features like, of that type. And the plant remains from the features reflect a diverse diet, including cattail and water lily tubers, fruit seeds from cherry and strawberry and sumac, as well as acorns. Um, and notably, a lot of these resources are early successional plants. Um, and wetland resources that would have been abundant and easily available in the post-Pleistocene environment. In the next period, the um, archaic, if you'd move forward, Eric, um, we see um, in the archaic tradition, populations lived during a time of dramatic environmental change. Early archaic people lived during the post-glacial times when there was a rapid expansion of new plant communities and fluctuating water levels. And again, as Jim had noted, there's really very scant information on early archaic populations. The middle archaic peoples um, were adapting to drier, warmer environmental conditions. They were pursuing a mobile hunter-gatherer lifestyle as their predecessors. And um, there are rock shelter sites in southwestern Wisconsin, Brogley Walk Sh Rock Shelter, for example, in Grant County, produced abundant nutshell, indicating that people were living in that area and harvesting nuts and likely living there during the cold season. And again, moving um, in the warm season to uh, exploit other resources, berries, tubers, greens, things like that. So moving seasonally to um, take advantage of resources in the locations they were available. The late archaic environment was much as it is today with um, the oak savannas in Southern Wisconsin transitioning to oak forests. Um, and 
archaic populations continued to occupy rock shelter sites, including, for example, Preston Rock Shelter um, in Grand County, the Durst and Raddatz Rock Shelters in Sauk County, um, <clears throat> which, um, as Jim noted, based on um, fauna, reflect a cold season occupation. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information um, on archaic subsistence um, with regard to plant resource exploitation, though we know that they did pursue a, a seasonal round exploiting summer fruits, fall nuts, um, tubers in the um, springtime, things like that. Uh, but we, we do know and understand is that there was population increase during the late archaic that would have limited group mobility. And it led to the establishment of regional territories. Um, in Illinois and other areas to the south, um, we see continued reoccupation of sites and the first evidence of incipient horticulture. Eric, if you could move us to the horticulture slide. Uh, the origins of our, um, agriculture is really not anything like what we learned in grade school. Uh, the earliest cultigens were squash varieties of summer squash and quinopod, what we now um, know as quinoa and are commonly used. And the earliest evidence for use of these resources comes from West Central Illinois around 8,000 years ago, we see the use of sunflower. And by 7,000 years ago, varieties of squash, similar to summer, uh, to summer squash were being used. And it's not till much later that we see corn, beans, and pumpkin varieties of squash mm -hmm. being introduced from Mesoamerica. The starchy seeded and oily seeded annuals depicted here, what we might consider to be weeds, um, were those resources that became cultigens. And um, it, they really evolved as cultigens through a symbiotic relationship with humans. And it, it's a great example of how natural selection operates. As populations grew and their territories became more constricted, um, they would return seasonally to the same camps and they would be harvesting these, again, oily and starchy seeded plants. Um, the more they harvested them, ate them, and distributed them through, you know, um, their harvest through um, cooking and processing through defecation, the more those plants would grow around their campsites. And so when they came back the next year and harvested them, they were selecting just by the fact that those plants were the ones that germinated and grew the next year, those that had a thinner seed coat and were, you know, um, uh, were germinating annually, what a characteristic of, of cultigens. So the plants had a thinner seed coat, they were more digestible. And it also turns out that many of them had a larger seed, in fact, again, and sort of a characteristic of cultigens. So you see an unintentional selection of these plants um, and an increase in seed size among some sunflower, for example, the seeds um, increased a uh, hundredfold from wild varieties. So if we move to the woodland now, Eric, um, early woodland peoples continued to pursue hunter-gatherer lifeway with limited use of cultivated um, crops. There are sites like Mill Creek near Prairie du Chien that produced a broad array of nuts, including hickory, walnut, hazelnut, and acorn, as well as fruits, sumac, grape, raspberry, blackberry, nightshade, and hawthorn, um, as well as cultivated plants, including squash and sunflower. And by about the middle woodland, um, you see populations really were what we would consider to be incipient horticultural, say we're actually um, planting gardens. So they continued to pursue a hunting and gathering lifestyle. They continued to move seasonally, but their summer camps, they would have gardens. Um, settlements were still seasonal, as I said, um, but we do see sites um, like the Millville site in Grant County that had 14 houses, some with actually separate storage rooms. And domesticated resources from the site include squash, sunflower, and sumpweed, as well as a variety of fruits and nuts and the first evidence for the use of wild rice. During the late woodland, there was an increased reliance on horticultural resources. Um, and again, hunting and gathering continued to occur, providing uh, subsistence staples. The Oneota further stabilized their subsistence with intensive exploitation of a variety of wild foods. And in Southwestern Wisconsin, we see heavy use of wild rice. Well, in other areas, we see use of other resources. Acorn was um, particularly important in some places. 
um, Oneota populations uh, in the northeast part of Wisconsin, for example. Interestingly, as um, many of you know, uh, food is, an in, is a really strong indicator of ethnicity. So it's not surprising that recent research comparing Mississippi and Oneota subsistence practices has begun to identify patterns relating to ethnogenesis of different cultural groups throughout Wisconsin and adjacent areas. And so with that, I say thank you for um, allowing me to um, give you a little intro to the subsistence of pre-contact people. Good evening, everybody. I wanna thank Eric for the uh, chance to be a part of this, this panel and, and uh, everyone who's participating uh, in, in these uh, presentations and also uh, the audience who, who is here to, uh, to listen to us talk about a few of these things. What I wanna run through very, very quickly is uh, Native American uh, lead mining in the upper Mississippi Valley um, in the, in the pre-contact or the end post-contact era. As most of you are likely aware, uh, the Driftless area, the Southern part, part of it contains the, the lead and zinc district, uh, which was extensive the area where there was extensive amount of mining of both these minerals. Um, and, but of course, this wasn't something that the Euro-Americans found out that this was the use of lead or galena uh, um, was, was used by Native American groups for many, many millennia. Um, way back into the archaic tradition, we find galena from the upper Mississippi Valley showing up in burials in places like Ontario, as well as in, in Poverty Point down in Louisiana. So this material was, was traded extensively across the mid-continent through time and was used as a grave offering, as, as a pigment, and as other as and other uses as well. After um, involvement with uh, intrusive Euro-Americans um, and the fur trade. Native American communities, there became a, uh, a global demand for the Galena uh, out of the upper Mississippi Valley. First and foremost for use obviously as shot um, for, for weapons, but also any number of other uses in the European market, as well as Native Americans own uses of this material for fish hooks, for buttons, obviously shot again for the inlay of catlinite pipes, the production of effigies, among other things. And then a, a lot of this went into, into exchange networks for the rival European powers. I wanna kind of focus everybody's attention on this, this map right here. This is a map that uh, a man named Chandler did in 1829. It is uh, full of all kinds of uh, misconceptions and factual errors, but it also contains some very important information uh, for the time period we're going to be talking about. Um, early French explorers uh, mention mining of, of Galena by the Dakota and the upper Mississippi Valley, as well as the Miami but it really becomes a massive kind of industrial scale operation in the upper Mississippi Valley Trench by the Meskwaki and in the Eastern part of the lead district by, by Ho-Chunk peoples. Um, and this map from 1829 shows, shows, you can see a blue circle there, that's, that's the uh, Meskwaki uh, village at Dubuque. Um, the yellow line represents a later demarcation that the American government worked out in treaty negotiations to where Americans could mine versus the area to the east where you see the red circles where there are Ho-Chunk villages and they were also mining extensively in this area. The majority of, of kind of scholarship or study of, of, of Native American lead mining focuses on largely the Meskwaki uh, efforts along Catfish Creek and the Dubuque area, as well as the Galena River and, and other areas. Uh, Dubuque is most well known in 1788. He was a French Canadian. He leased a track of land along the Mississippi from the Meskwaki to mine lead and he created an establishment that had warehouses and, and fur trade um, um, 
posts, as well as working with Meskwaki and Matisse and other groups to mine lead throughout the region, Catfish Creek, Apple River, Galena River, and he had a functioning trading network going on there. Uh, Dubuque ran into some debts um, in, in uh, 1804, this actually the same week the infamous treaty was being signed in St. Louis. He sold the lower half of his claim to the Chateau family, famous for being involved in the fur trade, did not tell the Meskwaki that he was uh, had sold land that they had in effect leased him. So when he when he died in, in 1810, a whole series of creditors came north to, to claim Dubuque's property and and there was a very tense confrontation with the Meskwaki that did not go well, and they, they refused to let these people um, into the area. And after that, the Meskwaki had a policy that Americans then, because they were very interested in, in the lead district, because there was obviously going to be upcoming war with Great Britain or potentially other European powers, and they had no real good supply of of lead for munitions. So they're very interested in this area. Um, the Meskwaki would allow American traders to set up trading posts on islands or at the mouths of creeks or come in flatboats and buy lead, but they could not see the mines under threat of death because they had had after this bad experience with Julian Dubuque. And this mining operations that were going on were really, really extensive. This was not scratching the surface or any of this business. These were, these were serious industrial scale mines where trenches were dug into the hillside to access large crevice deposits. The lead was brought out. It was smelted in stone lined trench furnaces into ingots or pigs. And then it was stacked up on, uh, on the riverbanks or the islands for, for traders to purchase. Um, and there are accounts by Henry Shreve of Shreveport and other flatboat operators coming up and buying 70 tons of lead and leaving much more on, on the banks. Um, there was a trading post some Americans established on the southern part of Dubuque's claim in 1811. In two months, they purchased 700,000 pounds of lead that went through the Fort Madison factory to the south. And it was so profitable that it was the only American factory that year to actually run in the black. So as the fur trade was being depleted, this was becoming a really important uh, source of income. And the, these images here, just this shows an old map and it shows what's called the Buck Range. You can see it in there. That is a large uh, Meskwaki trench mine. And you can see my father standing in that. It's, it's probably a hundred meters long and, and you know, a good, good five, 10 meters deep. It's, a, it's an enormous, enormous mine. This is a LIDAR picture of that. You can see the, the Meskwaki trench mine running across the hillside there, later on pockmarked by um, American prospect pits, which were sunk, shafts sunk you know, down instead of, instead of following the crevices in the way the Native Americans did. Mining is very difficult archeologically because every time there's new mining, it destroys the old mining. So, act, but we do have some cases of some of these trench mines still surviving in the Driftless area. Back to Chandler's map here. Um, I want to mention here that, that what happened in 1822 was, was there was the first lead lease by the federal government, they kept control of this land, um, was given to a Kentuckian in Galena. There was a very tense standoff with the Meskwaki because they did not see the Treaty of 1804 as valid. They backed down because the military intervened and Johnson set up shop in Galena and that was the beginning of, of the lead rush where thousands of people poured into the Galena River Valley, dispossessing the Meskwaki of that area. Most of them retreated across the river to, to Dubuque's mines. And this, this map captures that very clearly. You can see all the Euro-American settlements and furnaces and then in the Galena River Valley. And then to the east in the lead district, you still see Ho-Chunk villages and you still see um, 
you know, they were mining in the Sugar River and, and other areas. This yellow line was supposed to be the boundary marker between uh, Americans and, and Ho-Chunk, but if you were a smelter on government lands, you paid a 10% tax. If you trespassed on Ho-Chunk lands, you argued you weren't on government lands, you didn't pay the tax. So, so there was, and some of the lead agents actively encouraged people to trespass with armed and fortified settlements and to set up smelting establishments and very clearly stated in letters that they hoped that there would be bloodshed so that these, the whole chunk could be dispossessed of these lead mines. There, we don't know as much about the Ho-Chunk mining efforts, but it was extensive and it centered around the Sugar, Sugar River area. There are accounts by Esau Johnson of, of leaders like Spotted Arm having 52 smelting furnaces there. And, and these were really extensive operations. I wanna, again, I just wanna go back. I wanna see this little blue area is, is, is called Grashets Grove. That is an area where Americans had attempted to set up on, on this line of demarcation. They'd been expelled. And it looks like the Ho-Chunk invited the Gratiot brothers, especially Henry Gratiot, who became a sub-agent for the Rock River bands, to establish a, a trading post and warehouses and a mining operation, which kind of grew into this large community of Matisse and Swiss and Ho-Chunk and French and Americans. It's kind of an incipient Creole community that disintegrated um, after the the Black Hawk War. A uh, similar community was developing in the Sugar River um, area as well, and that was also destroyed by the upheaval of that time. But inviting the Gratiots up to that area may well have been intentional on their part. The Gratiots' mother was a chateau, so she, they had vast connections to people who were involved in the fur trade, and it may have been an attempt to have relationships with people who were not as hostile as the majority of American Anglo prospectors who were coming out of Kentucky and Missouri and Tennessee and the Upper South and were uh, not friendly to any Native American concerns. Um, the Gratiots were in that area for, for quite some time and they held this mediating position on this kind of frontier area. There are accounts of Ho-Chunk families coming back to Gratiot's Grove, which is south of Shulzburg, into the late 19th century. And there are photographs from Shulzburg Sesquicentennial uh, in 1927 with a very large Ho-Chunk delegation there. So these connections stayed over time. This is the one of the older Gratiot houses and Henry Gratiot is shown here. This is just an image of material that, that metal detectors had picked up on Ho-Chunk villages from the 1820s along Lake Koshkanon. Lots of um, raw lead cubes, smelted lead, lead turned into pipes, buttons, and as well as what I have often called turtle effigies, whether they are not, whether they are or not, I don't know, but these kind of effigies seem to show up on these sites from the 1820s. Um, fairly frequently, as well as places like Gratiot's Grove and other areas. Ultimately, this mining tradition came to an end um, after you know, the treaties in 1832, after the Black Hawk War, which dispossessed some, the Meskwaki of the area as well as the Ho-Chunk, but this was a really critical um, part of understanding dynamics in, in the upper Mississippi Valley. Um, among these groups through the 1820s and 30s. And I just want to stress again that this, this was a really substantial industry that was, that was operating and it, it set the stage and laid the groundwork for what Euro-Americans did after they came into the area as far as, as far as lead mining. And I will let it go there and, um, and, and, and stop for now. <clears throat> That was great, uh, Philip. Thank you so much. Um, my head is uh, uh, so excited, full of ideas uh, from each uh, of you this evening, and we've gotten some great questions that come in. I'm sure our uh, audience has found this quite fascinating and uh, wanted to let folks know uh, what will happen um, from this point in the talk on. Uh, we are uh, going to go through a little Q&A session. 
And then for those who would like to stick around, uh, we will play two short videos, uh, a one and a half minute teaser of a new exhibition here at the museum called uh, 13,000 Years of Driftless Ingenuity uh, that sort of is built around some of the ideas that you've heard today. Um, and then uh, a, another few minute video uh, that's really great quality of uh, Ernie Bozhart uh, showing how to uh, flint nap, which is the process of uh, making a projectile point. And so this is going to be a good time uh, where if you haven't already typed out your question, please do so now. And, uh, and then after folks, uh, after our panelists answer those, then we'll move on to these two optional videos. Um, so uh, all of you at home and the panelists are invited to stay as long as you'd like. And if you need to sign off, uh, you'll have access to the recording of this uh, video to watch later. So um, I know that uh, Bill Quackenbush has uh, started typing out some answers, but in case you'd like to elaborate verbally, the first question that came in from Thomas was, uh, how much do the oral history stories change over generations as told by Native Americans? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so I did uh, begin to uh, type uh, somewhat of an answer there, but um, I ran out of letters. So, and it didn't complete. Uh, so in short, oral history for us uh, doesn't change too much through time. Uh, we have uh, different processes in place to assure that uh, uh, the stories remain accurate, um, whether it's through song, right? You sing a song time and time again, the words stay the same. And that is done through uh, different processes to pass on uh, stories uh, uh, saved by clan, for example. Um, uh, redundancy, right? Um, and through multi-generational uh, st uh, storytelling. Um, I mentioned uh, the fact in that, and when I rewrote there is that, you know, if, uh, and in our, in our lives of old, you know, and even today, you know, we have several generations that live together and we always leave it up to our elders to teach our grandchildren and our children. And, uh, and if we learned that story and our parents learned that story and our grandparents are telling that story, um, when they're telling that story and they have something that isn't what we learned, um, you have to stop that individual and, and correct them, you know, right? And so say, you know, like I mentioned in the, when I wrote, like if I said Jack and Jill went up the hill and to answer that, you'd say to fetch a pail of water. And if I said Jack and Jane went up the hill, uh, my, you know, siblings or my folks around us said, no, Joker, that isn't how it goes. It's Jack and Jill went up the hill. And I would then be forced to say, oh, yeah, that's right. You know, Jack and Jill went up the hill. And so multi-generational occupancy of our lodges of old, during the winter times, that's our educational sites. That's our educational schools of today are no different than our lodges of old. That's when our children were you know, sitting with our elders and such throughout the winter to learn about these stories and oral histories and so on and so forth. So there's a redundancy process in place. And then, and another form of education is, you know, you can literally see written in stone our history throughout our ancestral footprint, through our rock shelters, our petroglyphs, and so on and so forth. And uh, those stories can't change. There they are. And the first people telling them when they're brought there as a youth and brought there as adolescents and grown ups and now they're elders and they're telling that same story that is carved in those stones as you pass it on to the next generation. Uh, those stories has to be told in certain specific ways. So there's ways of passing on history uh, where it isn't necessary to rely on such things as electronic process or written language. There's other ways to our oral history that we pass on ours. I hope that answers some of that question. Thank you so much. Bill Hurley's got a question. Uh, it's, it says Native Americans often reference a much longer time depth than archeologists do. He's heard of a pre-Clovis concept. Is there evidence of uh, this in the Driftless area or in any of the artifacts in our collection? Ernie, would you be interested in taking uh, that? Well, from, from an argument, I mean, you know, Ho Chunk, you know, Bill would say Ho Chunk have always been here. You know, that's, that's a, that's one, that's a framework in time that's, 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 you know, not radiocarbon based and, and such. From an archaeological standpoint, there are no pre-Clovis sites known in the Driftless area that I know of. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll shadow uh, somewhat what Bernie was um, mentioning is that when we speak about time, we don't talk about, you know, 
dates and times on the way back. We just talk about um, our origin stories and this is uh, where we were placed by our creator, Maon, all right, the earth maker. And this is where our first fires were lit. And on the end of that 50 foot rope that I might not have mentioned the length of it is 12,000 years. While that is speculative at best, it's when our, our beginning oral history uh, takes place. And <clears throat> we talk about the, the period of time along that rope, for example, on there, um, that historic periods is 1492. Well, obviously that'd be, you know, you know, certain so many inches down that rope. All the way back to these stories that we have back to during that last glacier period. Now that may not be 12 years, thousand, that might be 8,000, might be 15,000. It really doesn't matter to us. It's just, it's, that's when our origin stories place us here. And we have knowledge, accurate knowledge about that glacier episode and the receding of the ice and the formation of the Wisconsin River, for example, and the Mississippi and how the Cooley regions began today. All these beautiful stories are something that we still hold near and dear to our heart. We pass these on from generation to generation and they don't change. Well, stories can't change. It's set in stone. It's it's told throughout the duration of our histories. So, yeah, so sorry about that, Reed. Thank you. Um, one of our, uh, here, let's see. Now we've also got someone asking about a couple of different sort of plants and making them edible. Um, one asks about nightshade and how could uh, plants in the nightshade family have been used as a food source? or other applications? Right. Um, uh, there are um, a lot, uh, multiple species of nightshade. So the ones that were exploited or the one that was exploited by native peoples was American nightshade, Solanum americanum. And there are sites with thousands of berry seeds. So they were you know, exploiting the berries as you would raspberries or blueberries or any other berry. You know, They may have eaten them raw. Um, you know, just fresh, or they may have put them into uh, pemmican or something like that, or fruit roll-ups, any of that kind of thing that they would use. What we see a lot of, though, is black nightshade, which is a European um, weed that was introduced and is basically invasive. So, you know, when we think about nightshade, we got commonly think, oh, we can't eat it. Well, you just have to be very careful in terms of what uh, what species you're exploiting but it was a very common fruit that was used and the greens can also be um, eaten. And uh, in a similar vein, Amy Haig asks about how uh, people processed acorns to make them edible. Mm -hmm. And acorns, um, it's, you know, you can use both the, the red and white types of uh, acorn, but mostly it's the white that are used um, and those can be leached. So, uh, you know, often, you know, dry them so you can get the shells off, make sure you uh, kill any of the insects that are in them, they can be stored that way. And then they would leach the, the fruits within the, the meats um, a couple of times until you got the tannins out of it. And then that would be processed into a flour and could be used as a, a flour base of grain. It's actually very tasty. Yeah. I'll, uh... I'll shadow what Katie says on that. We actually harvest acorn, my family, and as I make, I make a tack out of it, for example. Uh, just as an experiment, I actually have tack on my basement right now that's close to probably 12 years old, and it's still as good as the, the moment you made it there, too. And the acorn, was, that was a bur oak out of the Madison area that was gifted to us there. And I didn't want to throw it away because even though you can get a bucket of acorns, you know, you got to do something with it, they say. So we need that. Uh, uh, hard tack out of that too, but it makes a beautiful flower. It makes good pond pancakes. Uh, so yeah, you definitely it takes more time and effort. That's why it's easier to go buy flour nowadays too. A lot of things you'll find uh, that's more easier to do something different. So you just kind of use the more modern day processes. But the old station, the old way still works. So. And of course, they eat a lot of uh, other nuts. You know, hickory nuts and black walnuts, things like that. And you always kind of think, you know, how did they? get enough of it, you know, you think about picking it and how difficult that is, but there are, um, there is good evidence for just smashing them up, throwing them in a pot, boiling them, and then the nut meats and the oils would float to the top, the shells would settle to the bottom, and you can skim that off and, you know, make a good source of food that way. So again, you're not picking them out the way we would normally do that. Yeah, you, get, you need to remember diversity is key. Uh, right. We don't like eating the same thing week in, week out, no different than um, today as, as it is in the past there too. I mean, every plant has its due time, every nut, 
every berry, every type of bark that you utilize, any type of plant. And you have to remember too, uh, when they do the research on these plants and they find the seeds and other items over here, um, most, most generally, you know, we view, you know, everything we take in native wise as, as medicine, the air we breathe, you know, the water we drink, you know, the food we take in, the socializing we do, it's all good medicine that we're supposed to impart upon ourselves. And so when you find these food resources, you know, these villages, um, there's a diversity of it there, like milkweed right now, it's poisonous, right? It's, it's tough on you, but we, man, that's one of the best meals we have. In the spring, a certain time of year, you go out there and harvest the, the milkweed buds out there and you make it the, one of the best stews. And I'll tell you what, if you eat that stew, it, you feel so energetic and so alive. There's so much potassium and so much other stuff that you don't get during the winter long months. And then when you're, you just look forward to it. Like I say, yeah, it makes great food, you know. So it's just, they always say that everything that our grandmother of the earth gives us, there's a purpose for. You just got to find out what that purpose is. And that's just the way it seems. And if it wasn't food, it wasn't medicine, it was used for other processes there, maybe for uh, to help relieve stress. So that's where you get your sweet grasses and, and your sages and all that other types of medicine that you take in with a woman. Anyway. Just like today. They have certain things to help uh, relieve stress. Those are important too. Uh, another uh, questioner is interested in communication over space. So some of the territory that uh, we've looked at on maps uh, was vast. And so how would communicate, how, how far did people tend to venture? And then how would they have communicated from settlement to settlement? That's a really interesting question. I read that on there, and uh, it was too much to talk about uh, by typing it up. I'm just not that way with the computer. Um, but we have runners of old, you know, our bear, our, our buffalo plant, for example, they're their town criers or orators, and uh, they're the ones that were instructed always to spread the news. And they had runners. You look at a map of Wisconsin and Illinois and along the Mississippi there, and it's just an extensive array of Indian Trail. So these are the routes that, you know, that these runners could go at at a fast pace. And so in the spring, when they were holding our general assemblies, our general councils of old, uh, they would send their runners out there with calendar sticks. And calendar sticks had the moons on there and the dates and almost basically the time out there that they would run to the different communities out there uh, that through those long winter months would go and hold up. You know, they'd run those calendar sticks out there. And this is a certain date and time you know, that were showing up there at a certain space that they had designated, and that would be it. And so just like magic, everybody would show up there for those general councils, and then they'd be fast marching off to those spring camps out there to do their sugar bushing, right, and preparing their seeds for the crops and carrying on for the next three months and some of them. So, uh, so they had runners, no different than today, but we have runners. You know, we, we have Mail Express, right? That's what, well, like it's snail mail now. Now we have computers. You know, so we just utilize, you know, what we, always ever did the easiest way of communicating with one another so uh, they mentioned the villages were kind of spread out and, and and in fact they really weren't you know we live in a day and age where we feel like you know a distance unless you travel with a vehicle you know it's a long ways but in reality it isn't case in point down there in your neck of the woods down there in Platteville or at least from Prairie du Chien to Milwaukee there used to be an annual run Try to compete on there. And there's a halfway tree. I think it's over in, was it, Green Coney? There's a halfway wow. tree there that marks the halfway distance on there that the Potawatomi come and said, don't cut down that tree. That's a special marker. But I think they had like surveying done and they showed that that tree is in fact so many paces off from being exactly halfway in the beginning and the end of that runners. And there was, they thought nothing up covering the distance. Um, I, I, I know there's stories about people going from Chicago up to Green Bay and back you know, in a relatively short period of time as tribal members on there. And they would just have their certain villages they knew that they were going to hold up and they had it all planned out. And it's just a matter of a slower process, but they did it. So anyway, sorry about that too. Well, this is fascinating. I've got one quick question myself, and then maybe we can quick shift gears a little bit. And that is uh, with regard to uh, rock shelters. And uh, Jim, you were talking about, um, you know, a kind of a passive solar uh, residence in which if you found a rock shelter that was facing south or southwest, uh, and you would become a thermal mass and uh, absorb some of the warmth and uh, shelter you from the north winds. And uh, 
And of course, the shelter that in your picture, you would have had a wide open view for a beautiful vista. And is there any archeological evidence? I'm not sure how well these uh, certain materials are preserved, but was there evidence for any kind of uh, covering of the open end, either like wood or some other material to uh, as serve as a wind block? Uh, not that I know of, but I would presume there there had been some kind of a block there. Uh, it would be very logical and very easy to close those off. And uh, it's interesting, uh, Ernie and I worked in a rock shelter several years ago, very briefly doing a little salvage in Vernon County. And it was spring, or early summer, and it got very hot there. <laughs> it was not a good place in the summer, but it would have been a great place in the winter and protected environment. So, no, I don't know of, of good data. Uh, we hopefully don't dig many rock shelters anymore, and a lot of them were done at a time that perhaps people weren't as careful as they should be in excavating them. But presume they were closed off somewhat. Fascinating. So does anybody have any, uh, any, any final thoughts um, of closure before we wrap up and um, shift gears a little bit and, and look at uh, uh, the exhibit and the, flint, and the flint napping demonstration? Well, I just want to thank everybody else for joining in. And, uh, and I thought it was, it was a real nice complimentary set of, set of pretty, you know, fairly diverse, but, but overlapped quite a bit. And, and, uh, and I think it was nice to it was nice to talk Ho Chunk and archaeology in the same program and, and see so much overlap. I think it was great. Yeah. I agree. This is a fascinating conversation. And, uh, you know, I feel like um, it this would be a great uh, group to get around with a delicious beverage and, and, and talk for hours. So I'll, I'll hope that we have a chance to speak again. Um, so I uh, so let, let me also uh, do some thanking here. Um, uh, of course, with uh, thanks to Wisconsin Humanities, we were able to uh, do make some great headway here with uh, both the behind the scenes curatorial work of our uh, lithic tool collection, um, but also it was uh, really through the expertise of uh, Ernie Bozhart, Danielle Benden, and then also just a shout out to our uh, staff member, uh, Rachel Vang, um, who's uh, funded by an IMLS grant and then also by uh, our Wisconsin Humanities grant to help uh, do some of the hands-on work here involved with this project. So I'm going to share my screen real quick and uh, just kind of, it's, it's a quick minute and a half teaser of um, a physical exhibit that came from our project that you'll be able to see uh, when we open uh, for the season May 1st. Are you guys able to see kind of a white screen right now? I'm going to go ahead and uh, hit play on this little uh, video and kind of talk you through it. So our uh, exhibit is, consists of three cases. The one closest to us focused on uh, lithic uh, raw materials. Um, and, uh, and so that includes both metallic ores, such as uh, galena uh, and other things, but also uh, non-metallic ores, like uh, Silurian chert, galena chert, Hickston's lisified sandstone, Moline limestone, Burlington uh, chert, things uh, that were used to make these lithic tools over 13,000 years. And then we see some other key ores uh, and then arrange those tools uh, uh, in chronological order. Now, the second case, we've got uh, plant and animal materials. We've got materials used to make cordage, uh, uh, reeds to make things like mats and baskets for food storage, uh, nuts and seeds, pelts, uh, and other lithic tools, uh, even musical instruments like bone rasps and other miscellaneous things. And then this third case focuses on three processes. Uh, the first is pottery making, and we see raw material and the technique uh, used for making pots, even the crushing up of shell to use as temper for a higher quality product. Here we have hide making, tools used for scraping, sewing, puncturing, tanning. And here the third is uh, the process of flint napping, which is uh, creating those chip tools. And we'll have a, a more detailed video on that in the future. So um, this is just a quick, super quick uh, teaser of that. Uh, um, with a, there are also posters that accompany this, uh, as well as um, you may recall Rollo Jameson's uh, collection uh, beginning with 
a uh, collage of lithic tools that spell out his initials in the year 1905, and we've got a new interpretation that uh, identifies each and every uh, point in that collage, and, um, and uh, with some thinking about the ways of life of people who made those tools over time. So anyway, um, you'll have to come and check that out here in May. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch gears here and uh, and move into the flint napping video. Any questions or comments before I do that? I, I just some of the replicas in the exhibit, uh, Bill. I come from, some of them came from Parsons and uh, up in the Dells there. So we got we tapped into the to the because yeah. obviously not a, not a lot of preservation of animal hide. Yeah, right on. A lot of the bone and things like that. He needs a little help pull there. So. Yeah, that's kind of what's fun about this. There's a combination of mu of museum artifacts and and then a variety of, of props and uh, and some items on loan from Driftless Pathways. Um, so really pretty interesting. That the idea was to really kind of uh, think about how uh, you know the tale of human life and uh, you know seasonality and uh, how people uh, and the building of culture um, and how these objects kind of help to share those share those life ways. So um, yeah, it's kind of fun. You know, Eric. Um, so everything we do today, right? You know, uh, our women and children, you know, and and our men of young, the young, you know, middle aged and old, we all have our uh, enjoyments in life, and that is rarely displayed. You know, all of the spring and summer and fall and winter games, for example. You know, there's just a host of them. You know, and we just participated in, in uh, a snow snake event right here. As a, it was a Great Lakes regional game that was intertribal. And so none of the displays, you know, usually shows intertribal processes even. Uh, the gathering of together for the green corn dance, right? The green corn dance and all the things of enjoyment that we always have always wanted to have it did. And that's rarely displayed. That always show, you know, these tools that we use for hunted and making food. That's about it. You know, and so, you know, these you have an opportunity there to fully display or better display, you know, of the way of life. You mentioned that yourself, you know, display that, you know, what no different than today. So. Wonderful. That's a great point. That's a nice opportunity. And uh, I'd like to uh, invite uh, all of you panelists, if you haven't been by it, I'd love to have you come and uh, we'll speak a little bit more in depth and continue to make uh, refinements to what we've done here before in time, time for a reopening. So uh, now I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and uh, we've got a, a wonderful uh, six-minute video of uh, Ernie Bo Bozart uh, demonstrating shipping stone tools. So if I can share my screen here. My thumb. Don't hit your thumb, though. I will. Okay, are we seeing seeing the opening screen here, guys? Yes. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm going to demonstrate flint napping, the craft of flint napping, which is chipping stone to make stone tools, and you break stone in a controlled fashion. And the key to that is to have rock that is glass-like. You know how brutal that is? Um, and this is Hickston silicified sandstone that um, we collected from farmer's fields around Silver Mound. It's, it's not a good idea to take stone off of Silver Mound itself. Um, so what I'm going to show you is there's a three three step process to flint napping, and I'll just demonstrate uh, the beginning of it, which is to have a good piece of, of glass like stone, silicified sandstone, and then the, to 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 reduce the weight of this and thin it down and to test the quality, I use a hammer stone. This is just a basalt river cobble or, or lake shore cobble from Lake Superior, um, and I'm going to I'm going to take this cobble, I'm going to balance the slab of, of Hickston in my in my hand, protect my lap with that leather. Take the, ha the hammer stone and I'm going to come down and I'm going to hit this and drive a flake off the bottom. So I have to actually read this shot, the, the, the stone. I'm going to hit it here and take a flake off down here if I hit it right at the right angle and with the right velocity. So here we go. A little flake. Here we go. Here we go. That flake broke. Let me go again. So this is a flake that I just knocked off of that back side of that thing. That's where it came from. And where I hit it, you can see a little gray spot. That's called the striking platform. And underneath it, on the inside of the flake, there's a bump right here. It's called a bulb of percussion. And all flakes that people make have striking platforms and bulbs of percussion. And that's what we tell 
man-made or people-made uh, artifacts from uh, natural fractured flint. Um, so what I could that so what I do is I can go around and I can chip this all the way around and I can get something that begins to look like this, like an oval shape that I begin to thin down and test the quality. And I would I would continue to do this and get this nice and thin. Then I could take that away from Silver Mound and use it as a stock tool uh, when I'm not at Silver Mound itself. Um, let me show you the next step is to take a flake like this. Let me just show you how sharp this is. First of all, these are like razor blades. So here's a piece of leather. And I had a piece I was gonna take off here. And I'm just gonna so you can skin an animal with just a flake. But the edge gets dull, and so you have you want to resharpen that edge and get it get it nice and tough again. But just like just with that that flake like that, you could you can make us a, a, a knife. Um, the next step is to take that flake. Excuse me one second. The next step is to take that flake, and I can turn that into a hide scraper by using a deer antler, the bottom of the deer antler. We call it a baton, and I'm just going to take that sharp edge that I just used to to. to uh, to cut that hide, and I'm going to turn that into a 45 degree angle, like if you can envision the, uh, the ice scraper for your windshield in the car, 45 degree angle with a flat bottom. So I'm just going to take this and just knock, knock off smaller flakes. So the first step with the hammer saw is called hard hammer percussion. This is soft hammer percussion, and I'm making smaller flakes. Everything I knock off is a flake. And I've straightened that edge, and when I flip it over, I don't know if you can see all the little nick marks there, but that is what I retouched, and that becomes a hide scraper to scrape the hair off the outside or the, the fatty tissue off the inside of the animal. So that's a tool that I just made, all right? Um, the final stage to make, let me give you an example here, let me pull one out. To make a finished tool, something like this. This is a replica, but to, to finish this, the edges here and to put the, the notches in to half this spear point onto a wooden shaft, um, you use the tip of a deer antler and you push off flakes. That's called pressure flaking. And I'll just show you how to do that. I'll take that same flake I just had um, and I have to protect my hand here because I'm going to push flakes off. I'm going to hold this in the deer antler here. I'm going to take this tip here and I'll just knock off. I'm just going to push off a series of flakes by pressure flaking, all right? Let's flip it over. You see those little chips I just took off of there? Do the same thing the other way. Tiny little pressure flakes. So you can see the flakes that just chimmed off right here. If I get the sun angle right, you see that? Let me get up to the tip and then I'll put a notch in this just to show you what it's like to make it a, an arrowhead or a spear point or a knife. To, to, from start to finish takes about a half hour to an hour to make one. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna show you how to notch it. Now you can see that the pressure flakes that just took off right there on that side and on this side a little bit. So to notch this, if that were a finished arrowhead, you take the pressure flaker and I just push straight down. This is a thick part. And I just push that U-shape out. I flip it over, do that again. Yeah, it's pretty thick right there right now. But that's how you would notch essentially an arrowhead. And that's the basics of flint napping. It's that easy, yeah. Huh? <laughs> you make it. You make it look. You make it look so easy. Chuck. <laughs> but it's a real art and science. Um, and uh, like when Bill Quackenbush uh, began his presentation, holding that tool in his hand, uh, you see how perfect all the edges were. Um, and you can only imagine how difficult it would be to achieve that uh, level of craftsmanship.
you know, just flint napping is something that I, I, I never, I almost never finished a, an, an arrowhead or a spear point just said, but I, but I just show people how to do it. And I, it's something I learned when I got in archaeology a long, long time ago. Um, it, but when you do it, you gain an appreciation for finding the finished artifacts and what it took to make that just, you know, by, by being able to push off a flake, you understand the skill and whatnot. It went in to make a Clovis point. It's just, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing what people were doing for so long. Recently for the exhibit, I, I made a few bone tools. I made my first bone fish hook. And, and it's really hard to work bone. <laughs> I never knew it, it was so hard to work bone, but it takes a long time. You know, and I'm cheating with a metal file and things like that. I can't imagine making bone tools with stone flakes to cut the bone and scrape the bone and scour the bone and shave the bone and sand it with a sandstone abrader. It would take days for what it would take. It took me to, a few hours to do. Um, it's just, you know, but, to, to, but it gives you an appreciation by doing experimental archaeology. I study ceramics, but I've never made a pot because I wouldn't know how to do it. But, but you get, you know, you just can appreciate the skill that, that goes into making, a, making a, a pot that you find. We find these broken fragments, but, but just to make the pot is just such an uh, amazing thing to think about. Flint napping kind of does that. Ernie, it's interesting how um, it, it's nice to study the theory, and, and uh, but then to actually go out there and do it physically and to learn that process, it just gives you a different mindset of really uh, the work that it requires to do. And oftentimes we talk about our our simple games of katsu, when it's a dice game, you know, and uh, the dice pieces are made out of, you know, antler bone, you know, or antler. And um, to make that by hand, um, I use modern technology with sanders and drills and so on and so forth. It still takes me time to do it. Um, but our, our, our concept of time is, is different today. And uh, so that's why those become family heirlooms. The double canoe, right, is given to a new husband and wife to carry on for that generation and maybe to the next because they're so hard to make. And they protected them, right? They would sink them every fall there so that they would survive through the winter so they didn't have that freeze dry to take place and crack them on the surface, right? So there's a process in place. And when, you know, the historic periods come along there and they began to destroy those villages of ours and ruin our crops, right? And burn our villages down, all that stuff would go away. It would take time to fix it. Uh, so it really sets you back in the process on there. And those stone tools, and I'm not an archeologist, so I don't really know if this is the case or not to study. Uh, but I'm guessing more times than not, if it's like our communities today, those elders that became proficient in doing one craft, they focused on that. And there was a miniature trade in the community. A uh, person that makes arrowheads of old, he had his own little area in the village. Because you don't want your arrowheads to be made all over the place because those things are razor sharp and it's lost in the sand. And you get those little kids running around there barefoot out there mud summer and not stepping on stone tools out there all the time. So they had their own designated area but this is where they would nap out there. And then they would trade their wares for maybe uh, something that they weren't proficient at, right? Uh, out harvesting, you know, game for food and stuff. They would have that trade in, in, in our community. So, but yeah, I think Eric is right. I think we could have a, a nice conversation over a certain choice of beverages. I recall uh, Phil making a grooved ax when he was 16 or 17 years old. It took him the summer but he, uh, he kept working away on it. Yeah, it was a three-quarter grooved ax and I worked with Toby on it and packed it out with shirt hammer stones and polished it on a sandstone slab and dutifully kept track of my hours. It was, it was 72 hours and that was, it was a lot of work. It's, it came out beautiful, but um, it, was, it was labor intensive. And you can see why when you find those you know, axes with the with the groove still intact and the blades obviously been worn down to that point that, you know, you didn't, you weren't flipping about these things. You used them until they were done because making another one took a long time. I remember going up in Northern Michigan one time and I was talking to some Ojibwe up there about how they used to just at the end of the year, they'd hang their snowshoes up in the trees around their villages and stuff like that because nobody thought of taking them. And if they did take them, they obviously must have needed it, you know, worse than the person that made them. Uh, so it was rare to lose your tools if you left them at a certain village or a camp. 
only time that you would end up losing us is if you were forced off your land or you were, didn't come back to that village you know old on there and those tools would be left sitting there <clears throat> so that but those malls of old you know that they used to make their lodges and such on there they got wore thin through time you know, and they, that's why you see you know them so wore out at times or large chips where they had been rehomed so the reuse is critical so say if i might uh share a, a question of mine and that is you know once you find something that works you stick with it and also these tools are durable so they did tend to survive um you know across uh vast time frames uh and yet some of the uses may have changed somewhat i'm thinking in terms of the size of certain uh mammals for example that may have been hunted uh say 12 13 000 years ago versus a few hundred but when you look at the uh, record of the tools, they're so, even though you may have been hunting a mammoth, the, the tool didn't necessarily get a lot larger. They, were, uh, they, they varied in size, but in some ways they didn't change much over many thousands of years, or the changes were more nuanced and really take an art, a keen and trained uh, artful eye to see what the different uh, generations uh, were. But uh, could someone just speak a little bit to that? Like, how would uh, what would a tool be like, say, to take down a mastodon or some other now extinct mammal versus uh, something maybe a thousand years ago? Jim, you want to take that? Ernie? Yeah, yeah. Jim, you want that? I, I I'll start it. You can help me. Uh, I, I, the, the fluted points, the Clovis points are remarkable. They've been hugely studied because they are so specialized. They're a little broader in the blade than they are at the haft. That the haft, the haft is carefully ground on each side where the, where the, where the, the, the sinew that held them onto a spear tip would, would, would be so they wouldn't cut through that. The, the flute or groove on each side is a very sophisticated process to do that. Uh, they were razor sharp. You saw the one I think Bill had in his hand. They're, they're marvelous tools and they were meant to penetrate deep. Uh, experiments with, with near perfect rep, uh, replicas on African elephants that were called out of a herd in Africa uh, showed that they could easily penetrate into the organs when thrown with a spear thrower or an addle addle. And uh, they're, they're very sophisticated tools uh, made out of the best tool stones. Uh, Kixton, solidified sandstone, Burlington chart, razor sharp. Uh, and the folks that made those were craftsmen and were just wonderful hunters. I, I think they, we, we underestimate the skill and knowledge involved in selecting the stone, hafting a point, making a point, hafting a point, and taking out an animal that's very big. So Ernie, would you add to that? I, I, would, just, I would just add that, um, you know, the, the, the Clovis points are about four, four to six inches long in a, a typical Clovis point. And, and, uh, and the points after that, the agate basin points, uh, which are after the, the megafauna become extinct or hunting buffalo for the most part, are actually bigger. They're longer, they're sl more slender, but, but it's not that they're hunting smaller or they're, they're not hunting bigger animals. It's just the technology, technology shifted to these long landslip blades. They're almost 10 inches long, some of them. And then they wear, will, they'll wear down to nubs and such. Um, um, what you do see in Paleo Indian time that does maybe refer, represent larger animals is the hide scrapers. Paleo Indian hide scrapers are pretty big compared to later hide scrapers. So, like the Oneota people are scraping bison hides, but they're you know, pretty small scrapers. Um, then the final point I would like to make is that is that you don't have to have a big projectile point to kill a big animal. So, at the only other people are taking down bison with a with a, with a, a, a an arrowhead this big, you know, an, an inch triangle because it's on an arrow and the key is you get it between the ribs into the harder lungs and you can drop a buffalo too. Yes. So the, per, the point is part of the story, but then there's the lashing and then the shaft that it was attached to is the other part of the story. How well are those items preserved in the record? Are, <laughs> they're, not, they're not preserved in the record. Um, well, it's based on 
on, not in our area in any case. They are in some dry shelters in the West or some Adelados and Adelado parts that are found that are quite old. We know quite a bit about those, uh, but uh, not, not, as, not as well as we would like. Uh, we, we think that uh, uh, it's possible based on some information from the West, again, from dry shelters, that the spear, the actual wooden spear shaft of an atlato was very valuable. And once it's made and perfectly crafted, uh, it might have been the, the case that the point could detach the animal made off or, or ran off, so to speak, uh, that the shaft might be lost or left behind and could be recycled. And if you will, you could reload that. And you reload that by using a short socketed wooden piece on your arrow point, your spear point in this case, and that fit into the bigger shaft. And that could, uh, uh, then you basically have a dart on the end of the spear that comes off and drops the shaft. And you can pick that shaft, literally have a bag of points, uh, spear points and reload your shaft. My understanding, it, take, it takes more time to make the shaft of a spear or a bundle of arrows uh, than it does to make the projectile points. The, the part that preserves is the easy part. So the, the shaft would have been more valuable. And, and if you can, re, you know, if you're going to lose, if you lose part of it, lose the point or the four shaft. Yeah. And, and, Thanks. I was trying to look for the right word. Yes, exactly. Well, this, I feel like uh, we've got so much to talk about. And I, uh, I think that the story of uh, these shirts and other glassy materials as being a, a, uh, very uh, profoundly important ore mineral for for society is one that uh, we'd like to start interpreting more and we've already begun to do it and we'll do more of it um, of course the history of the mining district uh, from the 1820s through the 1970s is rich and uh, we've uh, recently moved to a uh, to reviving an interpretive technique in which we uh, use the tale of three minerals as we move from the pre-Civil War to the post-Civil War and the 20th century days. And we've now uh, officially added these other ores as uh, being an, an, uh, an, an important part of the uh, evolution of the district and the way of life here. And so I think in the future, identifying then the quarries across the Driftless and beyond and uh, learning more about the uh, tools for uh, obtaining those resources, as well as in, uh, in trading them and then crafting them into the tools. I feel like there's a lot of uh, interpretation that we can do down down the road and more conversations to have with you all. Um, I, uh, I really hate to do it, but I feel like we should probably say good night for now and, uh, and hope that we can get together again in the future. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I hope that uh, you'll consider tuning in next week. Um, people from Platteville may remember uh, Dr. Nancy Von Meyer, who uh, after her uh, time as a mining engineering student went off to become a pioneer in the area of, uh, uh, of GIS, uh, digital mapping. And she's gonna be presenting on GIS in the mining district. Uh, that's next Sunday, same time, five o'clock. Uh, and that, that'll, that'll be uh, the sixth of seven Lyceum series. The final one will be on April 3rd. Uh, Luke Sprague presenting oral history, interviewing theory, processes, and techniques. It's been wonderful to have you. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It's uh, been a great honor to uh, converse with you um, and, uh, and we look forward to keeping in touch. Good night for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Guys, I'll take care. Right. You, you too. too. Thank you soon, Bill. And everyone.